participating in this lecture for the kind introduction by Professor Marx. And let me also congratulate you on your wonderful Jindal Global Law School. It has been a true pleasure for me to come here to learn from your students, to learn from all of you. And uh, I will certainly also learn a lot from this uh, conference here. Uh, the subject of our conference is multilateralism in the era of mega regionals, new directions in the global trading system. And the purpose of my lecture, brief lecture, uh, is uh, to focus on the impact of mega regionals on citizens and the WTO legal system. So I prepared four slides in order to help you under, to understand what I say. And I was given a time frame from, of 25 minutes. So I think I will respect the time frame. So uh, the first slide is about what is what are we talking about? What is the global trading system? And I think here a few words are useful because people define the global trading system in very diverse ways. And since uh, England unilaterally liberalized its corn laws in 1846, and since the first liberal <coughs> trade agreement between England and France in 1860, the liberal world trading system always evolved in a dialectic manner and in, often in a confrontational manner. And that is also true for GATT 1947, which was uh, the first worldwide multilateral trade agreement. But GATT evolved in eight GATT rounds, and many of these agreements, like the Kennedy Round Agreements, the Tokyo Round Agreements, were only concluded by 30 or so of the GATT contracting parties. There were hundreds of uh, voluntary export restraints, plurilateral trade agreements like the multi-fiber agreement, textiles agreement, and all this fragmented legal regime uh, of uh, the world trading system was integrated for the first time in human history in 1994 with the WTO agreement. And that was a political miracle. I was responsible for the uh, I was secretary to, for the Uruguay Round on Dispute Settlement, which elaborated the Dispute Settlement understanding. And no, nobody in the GATT, uh, when the Uruguay Round started in 1986, would have dreamt of this outcome. Now, 20 years later, we are again confronted with uh, 600 or more free, uh, free trade area agreements, plurilateral trade agreements, and mega regional agreements and the strategic question is uh, how should we perceive these agreements? Are they stumbling stones uh, impeding the WTO? Are they building blocks for a better future world trading system? How should we maintain the and promote the overall legal coherence of this fragmented legal system? My personal view has always been to perceive them positively and uh, for the reason that the more than 40 WTO members participating in the transatlantic or trans-Pacific uh, mega-regionals have sovereign rights to do so. They don't need an authorization by the WTO for this. So uh, here the problem is, as you know, that the, these FTAs are not effectively controlled by any WTO institution. The legal disciplines are different for the plurilateral trade agreements. So if you take the example of the current negotiations on the tra uh, uh, trade and services agreement among about 20 WTO members outside the WTO, nobody knows uh, how this agreement will be concluded. Will it be a preferential trade agreement in terms of Article 5 GATS? Will it be a, uh, an amendment of the GATS agreement, which would uh, require consensus? Will it be a plurilateral trade agreement in terms of the Annex 4 of the WTO agreement? We, nobody knows. But here there are strategic questions. And uh, one strategic question is, and that is important for India, I think, will these FTAs and PTAs re lead to the replacement of the WTO by a new WTO 2, similar to what happened in 1994 when the GATT 1947 was replaced by the WTO agreement? And I would uh, hope that uh, the mega-regional uh, agreements should be used for improving the WTO. But another question is, are these mega-regionals more legitimate? Are they more democratic? Are they more efficient? And uh, mo uh, many people in Europe would say no. And here, uh, I think there are uh, a lot of strategic questions 
And one fundamental problem of both the WTO and of these mega regionals is that they treat citizens as mere legal objects. They disempower citizens, and that is rather strange. I mean, in a democracy, we, the citizens, are the constituent powers. We are the democratic principles who delegate limited powers to government agents and who are responsible for holding uh, government agents accountable. We, the citizens, are the main economic actors, producers, investors, traders, consumers, and the whole history of republicanism over the past 2,500 years confirms if citizens don't assume responsibility for holding governments accountable, public goods will not be effectively protected. And the uh, uh, post-war history also confirms that the biggest mega-regional agreement which we have today, that is the free trade agreements between the 28 EU member states and the three EFTA uh, states in Europe, protects common markets, fundamental rights, labor rights, environmental rights, social rights, much more effectively than anywhere else in the world, because here they are protected as constitutional rights, they are protected by the European Court of Justice, by the EFTA Court, by the European Court of Human Rights, by multi-level parliamentary democratic institutions, so a cosmopolitan Republican model of multi-level governments of international public goods is not a utopia, it is feasible. So I move to my second slide and uh, I just mention for our later discussion the question, do India's trade and investment policies need new directions? I don't know the answer, I leave that to you, but I just uh, have listed four questions which I think some of you might discuss in the afternoon. Why has India used trade and investment liberalization less actively for transforming its national economy and for attracting foreign capital than China? In 1980, India received more capital than China. Today, China receives four times as much capital, foreign capital than India, and even little Singapore receives three times more foreign capital than uh, India. So are these opportunity costs a policy failure? I leave it to you to answer that. The second question is, why did China's economy and infrastructure grow much faster than India's since the 1980s? So again, China is a dictatorship, and India is a democracy, so I can imagine uh, reasonable answers to this question. I leave it to you. The third question is, why does China rank higher than India on the World Bank's Doing Business Index, or on the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Index? The fourth question is, are the EU reforms for reforming international investment law, for replacing investor state arbitration by a permanent international court and appellate court, are these a model for India? And should EU, the EU and India, as the two biggest uh, constitutional democracies in the world, uh, use their free trade area negotiations for as a strategic opportunity for improving multilateral governance of international public goods, for example, for empowering citizens, promoting civil society involvement. So here you have my four questions, and I don't know the answers, and I move to the next slide. And the next slide is about the impact of mega-regionals on the methodology of trade regulation. Now, uh, let me just recall, I have given here a class 14 hours in four days, including Saturday and Sunday, on legal methodology in international economic law. And let me just recall, legal methodology is essentially about three basic questions. The first question is, what is the legitimate role of law as an instrument of social regulation? The second question is, how to design a leg legitimate legal system, as defined by uh, Professor Hart in his famous book, for example, as primary rules of conduct and coherent secondary rules of recognition, change, and adjudication. And the third question, and the most difficult question, I think, is how to transform the law in the books into a legitimate law in action, that is, how to promote a legal culture which institutionalizes public reason, which protects the rights, the human rights of citizens, which protects human health, the welfare 
rather than power politics and interest group politics. So if we ask these three basic questions of legal methodology for the WTO legal system, the answers are rather disturbing and the answers are rather uh, controversial. So as you know, what is the legitimate function of WTO rules? Uh, here we have this uh, ideology cherished by WTO diplomats of member-driven governance, and in Europe at least, we increasingly criticize this as power politics. So, uh, unfortunately, this ideology also prevails in the mega-regional negotiations. So CETA, the EU, CETA, the EU Canada Free Trade Agreement, was negotiated during five years in almost complete secrecy, was published in September 2014 on the website in English language. And then European society reacted very negatively. The parliaments reacted very negatively. And the EU Commission was forced to introduce a public consultation on the investment chapter. And here there were 150,000 replies from civil society organizations and 97% of these replies were negative. And the parliaments, again, criticized uh, this intergovernmental uh, power politics behind uh, uh, closed doors. And the EU Commission was forced to replace investor state arbitration through a new chapter which has been concluded last week. And this new investment chapter provides for a transparent, permanent international investment court plus appellate review mechanism, which has certain advantages, but uh, here the question remains, is this a model for India? Is, is this really effectively protecting human rights, rights of citizens? And uh, I think uh, we can have a lot of doubts about this. The, sub, the second question of legal methodology, uh, how to design and interpret the WTO legal system as a legitimate, co coherent system of secondary rules, of recognition, uh, change, and adjudication. Again, uh, the answers are very crowding, in my view. So, as you may know, the appellate body and the WTO members emphasize very much the duty of the uh, WTO institutions to comply with the customary rules of treaty interpretation. But I always tell them, and they don't like to hear it, I, I'm very unpopular in the WTO, but I still keep my office for 35 years now. But I always tell them, you, you don't apply the rules of customary law. You, you focus on text, context, object, and purpose. But that is only the first step. And if you read Article 31 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, if you read the preamble of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, there is an explicit requirement, I quote, to interpret treaties, to settle disputes in conformity with principles of justice, comma, including human rights and fundamental freedoms for all. Who has introduced this text in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties? Most people don't know was Professor McDougall from Yale University, uh, who has his particular vision of a, of a policy-oriented jurisprudence, and who was a member of the US delegation negotiating the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And human rights are never mentioned in the WTO. Principles of justice, no WTO diplomat likes to discuss it. Sustainable development is an explicit objective of the WTO, but how to construe it? The UN High, uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights has rightly emphasized in a number of reports on the, w, on the human rights dimensions of the WTO that the WTO agreement must and can be interpreted in conformity with human rights and sustainable development should be interpreted, as Amatia Sen has explained it many years ago, as human development in conformity with human rights, not as Calder Hicks efficiency or some other strange uh, macroeconomic notion of GDP uh, of, a, of, a, of a country, regardless of the poverty of the system, of the, of the citizens. So another example which I mentioned in the slide here is that diplomats, I have been a diplomat for many years, uh, uh, representing Germany and the UN and, and, and the European Union, 
But I think many diplomats don't like to be held accountable in domestic courts and in domestic parliaments. It can be quite, quite demanding. And if you look at the WTO, then the rules on state responsibility are extremely limited by the diplomats. So you cannot ask for reparation of injury in the WTO, even though the customary rules on state responsibility provide for reparation of injury in case of violations. And uh, most uh, WTO uh, diplomats member, uh, and governments insist that domestic courts should not dare to hold governments accountable for violating their WTO rules. So most domestic courts do not do what the WTO agreement requires them to do, to protect individual access to domestic courts. Article 10 get, you have a dozen of WTO provisions, but this is just ignore it in WTO practice. So uh, if you then look at what Professor Hart calls the rules of recognition, these rules of recognition are handled in a completely non-inclusive manner, as if the diplomats have a diplomatic monopoly for interpreting WTO rules. So if you take a look at the qualification of the rules of recognition in Article 38 ICJ statute, there uh, the Article 30 a speaks of treaties among states, but customary law and principles, general principles of law recognized by civilized nations do not give a monopoly to diplomats. And here I think uh, we need much more inclusive uh, interpretations and legal practice in the WTO. And here is the problem. Uh, during the Uruguay round of the GATT, the negotiations were very much facilitated by an active involvement of the GATT Secretariat, which acted as a facilitator, as a mediator. If you look at the current Doha development round negotiations, the role of the WTO Secretariat is minimal. And um, a large part of these negotiations are conducted without involvement of the Secretariat. If you look at the GATT WTO legal services, Diplomats deliberately keep them small. There is an obvious lack of resources, and the uh, deadlines prescribed by the dispute settlement understanding can no longer be respected in practice because uh, there is a lack of legal staff. And this is ridiculous. If you look at the disputes, uh, the Airbus dispute involving billions of dollars, and then, I mean, the diplomats in the WTO budget committee refusing to appoint two or three additional positions for servicing these dispute settlement proceedings. So here, I think, uh, you find a lot of uh, examples uh, that this domination of the WTO by government executives pursuing their own interests and uh, keeping citizens outside, treating citizens as mere legal obje uh, object objects is a big problem. I move to my final uh, slide, and I have called it uh, Republican Constitutionalism because, uh, at least in Europe, we have a history of 2,500 years since the Republican Constitution of Rome, 2,500 years ago, where citizens struggle for better protection of public goods, and the Roman philosopher and uh, statesman Cicero defined republican, uh, republicanism in the area as the property of citizens. And here, I think, uh, it is uh, an enormous achievement that at the national level of governance, almost all EU member states have accepted constitutionalism as uh, the best legal methodology for protecting public goods. So constitutionalism means a legal methodology which focuses on two elements. First, as described by John Rawls in his famous book, Theory of Justice, or in his later book on uh, public reason, he, the first element is that you apply what psychologists call commitment theory. That is, you do what the uh, 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 American founding fathers did in their Declaration of Independence. You commit yourself to agreed principles of justice of a higher legal rank, and they were then specified in the US Constitution. And let me recall, the preamble of the US Constitution starts by saying, we want to institute justice. And these uh, principles of justice of a higher legal rank then 
must be, that's the second defining element, they must be constitutionalized by citizens struggling for transforming these principles of justice into democratic legislation, administration, education, international law. So constitutionalism has been accepted by most UN member states as the best, most successful legal methodology for protecting public goods at the national level, for transforming the law in the books into law in action, for institutionalizing public reason, how uh, John Rawls calls it in his book on uh, political liberalism. But here's the basic problem, which, I mean, uh, is ignored by most diplomats. The basic problem is that globalization has transformed most national public goods into international public goods. Human rights, rule of law, protection of the environment, protection of uh, an, uh, an efficient world trading system, monetary stability. These are all international aggregate public goods, which can be protected effectively only through a process of aggregation at local, national, regional, and multi-level international governments protecting these public goods. And here the problem remains that uh, UN and WTO governments remain disconnected. That is, they keep citizens out uh, of uh, the uh, rulemaking processes, and uh, they lack democratic accountability. The fact that it's a certain point, uh, at a certain uh, point of time, after five years of CETA, the parliaments are requested to rubber stamp these agreements with thousands of pages. That is a strange uh, conception of democracy. So here, I think, the basic question remains the classical Republican question. How to empower citizens? How to empower democratic institutions to take more uh, responsibility in rulemaking, in administration, and in education? Should the mega regional agreements only protect investor rights and not also all other human rights and labor rights, environmental rights, human right to health, and so far? We are all, I mean, uh, too much dominated by government executives and interest groups. And I think unless we, the citizens, assume more responsibility, uh, public goods will continue to be disregarded. So by way of conclusion, uh, I think we need a paradigm change in international law. That is, as you all know, international law evolved as an international law among sovereign states. And of course, the UN Charter emphasizes rightly the principle of sovereign equality of states that will always remain a foundation stone of international law. But decolonization, the universal uh, recognition of human rights, have transformed this international law of states into a law among peoples. But unfortunately, John Rawls, in his famous book on the law of peoples, he interprets this law of people from an American hegemonic perspective, which is fundamentally different from the UN human rights commitments to protecting not only civil and political, but also economic and social rights. So we have to go beyond, and we have to uh, make UN human rights law, which is a cosmopolitan regime, but which is not very effective, as you know. It does not protect judicial remedies. It is ignored in WTO law. It is ignored in many other areas of international relations. It is effectively protected in regional human rights law, for example, in Europe and in European economic law. So I think the challenge really is to promote cosmopolitan conceptions and republican conceptions of multi-level governance of international public goods. If you make an empirical study, that was the main conclusion of my book on international economic law in the 21st century. If you look at cosmopolitan legal regimes, like international commercial law, international labor law, international investment law, intellectual property law, human rights law, of course, human health law, uh, arguably, and other areas where citizens are empowered to enforce international rules in domestic courts, to hold governments accountable for abuses of power politics, to hold companies accountable for abuses of private power. These cosmopolitan regimes have generally been, generally been much more effective than Westphalian power politics in the UN and in the WTO. So my last word, and I think I'm still within the time, so uh, 
I think uh, India and the European Union, as the biggest two constitutional democracies, uh, should exercise leadership and use their frequent area uh, negotiations for promoting civil society support. And this cannot come from any other country in Asia. China is not a credible uh, leader. China remains, unfortunately, a dictatorship in spite of its enormous economic progress. And unless the European Union and India don't accept this challenge of leadership, unfortunately, it will not come from the United States, I think. And uh, so I think it is up to us, really the citizens. We have an enormous responsibility to challenge the diplomats and their power politics. Everybody who knows public choice theory understands why diplomats pursue their rational egoism like every, everybody else, and very often act in an unreasonable manner as explained by David Kahneman in his very entertaining book about thinking fast and slow. It's a wonderful book which I recommend to all of you. Thank you very much for your patience.